Okay, so, um, while we're just waiting, I'll tell you a little bit about myself, just get rid of that. I usually have brochures handed out, so that it waste, doesn't waste time me yapping about myself. Um, I started my career in barbering or men's hairdressing uh, in 18, or well, 19, uh, yeah, you can yourself adding the It feels like 80s. <laughs> and uh, I, um, I worked for a guy on, on Deepdale Road in Preston here. Uh, and after seven years, he um, sold me his business. And uh, a couple of years after that, I got married and we moved into the flat above the shop. And <coughs> after that, it it started to pick up again because the, the beetle long hair had hit barbering. And uh, instead of guys coming in every two weeks for a trim or whatever, it was every two years. And it, uh, it really was a dip point. So after that, really, um, I just got busier and busier and busier until if I really told you how busy I was, I, you would just would not believe me. So I'm not going to tell you about it, I'm going to say we're busy. Um, and after that, I went into teaching. Uh, two of Preston College's staff knocked on my shop door one evening and said, can you come and teach barbering? We've no barber to teach us at the new Preston College. So I'd never taught them in my life. So I said, well, all right then. So I used to go for a couple of hours on a Wednesday evening. And that started my interest in teaching, and I loved it, absolutely loved it. And it's, it's for the last 10 years, I took my cert head and everything, and I taught full time at Blackpool College, and Blackburn College, and Preston College. I go around demonstrating all over the place. So you can see that I just love doing what I do. And a day like this is, is brilliant for me, I just love it. Because I have this desire to get over to people um, what happened. Because you, you've come in half an hour after the film started. You know, I was there when it started, the film, and I know everything about what the problem is. You're picking it up from about half an hour gone, okay? And really, it's confusing. That's why I'm here today to help you, really, to get your head around it. If I get the opportunity to look after the clients, that's what I'll do. But essentially, you're here to watch me work and make me explain what I'm going to do. And you're very welcome to ask any questions you want, as I said, I'm here to to help you with your craft, with your, your career. Is that all right with everybody? Okay. I've also done lots of other things. Uh, I was a rock star for a bit, but I won't go into that. <laughs> uh, I've done lots of other things, and um, mostly I think I've been very fortunate. Um, I, I was just about starting doing competition work when Preston College came along and asked me. And uh, I decided I loved the teaching so much, I just disbanded the competition work. Anyway, I got asked to judge competitions in the Blackpool and Manchester and all over the place. So over the years, I've got involved in judging, teaching, uh, employing staff, bar, <coughs> the whole work, I've done the whole lot. And at the end of it, I was very privileged to stand watching the best barbers in the world, the world champions, and I picked up information, skills, and knowledge from them, and it's filtered down right through to my teaching. Because in competition world, that is where these standards are achieved. <coughs> if you watch your ladies' hairdressing competition work, and you see the beautiful, exaggerated colors and designs that they create, in its own way, that's what men's hairdressing does in competition work, but it's really strict really really clever you know you've got to learn high skills much more high skills than you do in your shop and because of that that's where you get your standards so i can actually advise you on things that you may say i don't know why you do that but i don't know why i do it okay so here beginneth the uh, the lesson here beginneth the start of, of today's uh, demonstration and and teaching. <clears throat> if you think, and Nigel's also clued on to this, if you think of our service in five stages, then you, any service that you do, perming, colouring, uh, facial hair, uh, shaving, haircuts, they're all contained in five services, five stages. 
The first stage is preparation. Now, I've done my best to prepare everything I need. It's a bit crude because I haven't got space for anything. But essentially, that's your preparation. Not just to bring all your equipment, but yourself. How you look professionally, how you turn out professionally. How you brush your teeth, cut your nails, polish your shoes, look presentable, professional. That is part of your preparation. Then, you come into observation. Now, observation starts when the client walks through the door. It's in two parts. The first part is when you see his height, his build, his age, his hairstyle, whether he's wearing facial hair, how he's dressed, his personality, all that information you probably do without realising it. But it's very important that you do take that in. So train yourself to observe. Now, when your client sits down, you do the second part of observation and you look for factors. You look for things on his head and neck that could affect what you're going to do. The first thing that would be obvious would be a contraindication, such as an open wound, because you could cross infect. Some people do have a, they say, oh, garage door fell on my head, you know, and it's open and weeping. Well, I'm sorry, but you'll have to make sure it heals first, because you could spread. On top of that, you've got the very short haircuts that we're doing now, like our friend here, really zero fades and things like that. If you had quite a lot of hair and he was hiding warts and pimples and scars and rashes and alopecia areatus at the back, if you went up with a clipper, he'd end up with it being cut off, which isn't very good. So we have to go observing, we have to look and we have to test the back of the neck and everywhere to check for any hidden factors. We have a look at his face shape through the mirror. We have a look at male pattern baldness. I'm just spotting. <laughs> <laughs> Starts at the front, then the crown, then gathers into this kind of horseshoe effect, okay? Um, some men are very conscious of it. Some men think that the longer they grow it, the better it covers, and it's just the opposite. Shorter layers cover better than long slanted ones, because the wind blows them and they part and they can see all the bald spots. So if all this to look at when you're doing factors, which I will do in a few minutes anyway, show you. Then we do consultations, that's preparation, observation, consultation. It's no good me doing what I want when the client has another idea of how he wants it, not because he'd be upset, but because he wouldn't pay me. That's the basis of it. We're professionals. That's the reason. So every time a client comes in, you ask them how do they want it, because if you don't do it like they want it, they won't pay you. And if you're self-employed, you won't have enough money to pay the bills. And if you are employed, your boss is going to tap you on the shoulder and say, excuse me, I want to work with you. Why is that man not paid for his haircut? I'm paying you, it's costing me £10 an hour to employ you. And I can't, you're, you're costing too much. You're not making any money on me, I'm sorry, I'll have to go. So the professionalism is that deep. So your client is important from that point of view. Now once you've done the consultation, it's a verbal contract. You decide what the client wants, you agree with them, you recommend, you advise, you do all those things. But at the end of the day, when you settle, it's a verbal contract. If you don't do it like he wants, you don't expect payment. The next thing is to implementation, that's called implement, that's actually do the job. And finally, verification, which is checking. Alright, so there's the five stages. If you're doing a perm or a colour, it will be exactly the same. You go through the same process, all that. Alright, any questions on that? It's called POCIV, P-O-C-I-V. That's the best way to remember it. Very good tip for you. Okay. Now I'm going to bring our, our friend here to sit down and then uh, we'll take it from here. It's, it's very brave of him, it's not easy to face a lot of students and uh, wonder what's going on. Is that right? That's fine. <laughs> That's fine. So, do you know, I've forgotten his name, Maurice J. Stewart. That's fine. That's fine. Uh, Stuart's very kindly model. Now, if you ask a hairdresser to have a look at the hairstyle, they'll stand at the front. If you ask a barber to look at his hairstyle, they'll go around the back. Because the back tells him far more about anything else of that hairstyle. So, the first thing is, observation as he walked in. I noticed he was taller than me, how he was dressed. He's obviously got a tie on, smart, he's official. He works in the college anyway, so he's got to have an image. So, we're not looking at dyeing his head red, white and blue and a, and a, uh, a funky top red. We're looking at something acceptable to his surrounding and the job he's got. 
That's all. That's all it was. Sometimes you can be fooled. Sometimes you can have um, a man walking with a t-shirt and jeans, very relaxed, very sort of, very casually dressed, and wants a formal haircut, side parting, combed across, and you think, well, do you not want to change? No, I work in the bank and I've got to look smart, you know, so you can be fooled by things like that. And footballers might come in and they want something really way out. So you have all these things that you've got, you've got to be aware of. Okay, so Stuart sat down now and I'm going to cut his hair. Uh, that's the observation, part one over with. I've got my comb ready, which is clean, when well, I find it, which is clean. And if you'll notice, I haven't put the gown round yet. I've got a clean comb that's been disinfected. And I now observe. I comb through his hair, I'm feeling the texture of his hair, I'm scratching his skin gently to check if there's any warts or pimples hidden underneath. And I was doing a demonstration in Blackburn yesterday and I missed a wart. I was combing through the man's hair and I missed it completely. Luckily enough it was a, a big one. I wouldn't stick out too much. And uh, when I started to use the clippers, I spotted it. But that was lucky, that's what you must do this. Uh, he's got a lovely head of hair, uh, nearly as much as me. And uh, looking at the, the patterns and things there, okay on that. Um, I'm going to turn you around a little bit, that's it. We now look at probably the most important part. Sorry if you, if you want to get it. If you want to change seats, you have a, have a seat there. You'll find it a little bit easier. The closer you get to this kind of work, the better it is to be truthful. Now we look at underneath, and we look at his hairline. Now, us British guys, we have not got a reputation for good necklines. And uh, Stuart, no exam, no, nothing different. It's growing internally, it's growing, <coughs> creates points and all sorts of curls. We have to live with that. Um, the Mediterranean guys, the Asian guys, usually have lovely full necklines that you can do some beautiful work, like, like these necklines here. But unfortunately, we have to, we, we come from the Vikings, we come from Scandinavia mainly, and that's, they're not good quality hair either. So with a fairer skin, the fairer texture, um, if you've got some DNA from past thousands of years ago where you were in the in Mediterranean area, you probably, it'll show in your hairstyle. But essentially, we're not a problem with that, we have to get around it anyway, we, we, we can deal with that, it's no problem. It gets a bit complicated and technical in a minute, so I'll just, I'll just keep going. Now, I've had a good look round. I've checked he's got two ears. One sticks out very slightly more than the other. I haven't got a mirror in front of me, but I can see the, the, the head shape smashing. That's great. Um, a little bit on the long side. Um, not, not a lot of width here. This is technical, this is not personal. <laughs> and um, that is what you look for. Of course, you always try and create, eventually, the oval shape. David Beckham's your classic example. You do anything on this, because he's got that brilliant head shape. It just, it just sets him up. But what you have to do, perhaps, is to build this out so that you do have that. So you get like a, a bucket shape effect, if you will. Right. Now, I've observed right round. I haven't found any contraindications. <coughs> if I had, I would have stopped it. I haven't gowned up, so I've not soiled my, my cloth. I've not soiled anything, my comb or anything. So I can simply put these down and uh, he, he will put, put that, wash that obviously. And then I'll just ask, ask him to come back when the problem has been resolved. Sometimes you get children with head lice, so that would be a, a contraindication. You wouldn't do it, you <coughs> simply wouldn't do it. All right, you can do things like uh, psoriasis and what have you because it's not <coughs> contagious. So you can, you, if you have that, you've got to be very gentle and careful and obviously high standards of hygiene afterwards. But it tends to be all right. Okay, now I'm going to go to consultation and ask our friend here how he wants it cutting. Um, in this case, I'm, I'm only going to do a trim, basic haircut. That's all I'm going to do. So uh, I don't think you want anything different than that, do you? Yeah, that's fine. That's fine. That's fine. So when you have a mob, it's not quite the same as your commercial world. So now I'm going to go through that process of cutting this gentleman's hair as 
as a client or as a model. Okay. <coughs> so I've passed the first three of uh, preparation, observation, and consultation. Now I'm going to gown up. Now you can see he's wearing a collar and tie. Now I'm going to ask him to undo his tie if he will, please, and loosen the neck as much as he can. Because a man's neckline starts on the shoulders. It doesn't start on the neck itself. The shoulder, we've got to really get down to the back of the shoulder because that is where it all starts, down here. We have to deal with any hair that's created or loose around the very, very bottom. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm now going to, if I may, turn your collar inside, if that's okay. Thank you. Oh, that's great. Now, it hasn't a lot of neck hair, but that is essentially what you're looking for, to create that amount of space. That's why I don't use cutting collars, because cutting collars lift up too high. I don't think they're very hygienic either. Now we are going to apply a little bit of hand sanitising stuff on myself, because that will help stop the cross infection. Let your client see it, because he'll pick up on it and they'll say, you're the only barber that does that. And I'll say, yeah, well, we, we have very high standards here of hygiene. And that will bring him back, trust me. As opposed to the guy whose place is dirty and hair all over the place. And, and he, he, he will leave that client and come to you. I, I used to have a sign in my uh, staff room. And it used to read, we, that's including myself and the, all the staff, we must never do anything to stop that client from coming back. If you eliminate all the things that you can say, I'm not going back to that place, you'll have a successful business. Because you, all our jobs are all based on regular clients. So now I'm going to take a piece of disposable neck strip and stretch it and find the two dark blue bits, place it just around the neck. And now I'm going to spread the cloth from the front, cover its clothes to protect them from the hairs. And make it reasonably tight. Not too tight. Ah. <laughs> Fold the disposable neck strip over and then ask the client if he has a problem with cotton wool at all. Do you have a problem with cotton wool? No. Like Some do. Some men cannot stand <coughs> the touch and feel of cotton wool and some are actually allergic to it. It's a fancy medical term, I forgot what it is, but it's, uh, it is a common medical, not common, it is a medical term. Just a thin strip of cotton wool placed, tucked down. Now that stops any clippings from going down the neck or helps stop them. Once again, this client going back to work straight away, has some time to shower, doesn't want to be itching all afternoon. That will help a lot at the spot back. So put right down. The disposable neck strip is protecting him from the last person who used this gown. We don't use a fresh gown on every client, it would be silly. But we can use that gown for, say, a dozen clients, as long as we protect the bit that's the the neck. So there we are. The client is all prepared. I'm going to turn around now. The adjustable chair, the hydraulic chair, getting to the right height. Now I'm going to proceed with the actual haircut of long last. I take a number four comb, which is the most commonest comb. Very expensive now. How on earth they're asking six or seven pounds a comb? I do not know. It's a scandal. And you really need these hard combs, these hard rubber combs, rather than nylon ones. Because the nylon ones, they last longer, but they, they attract static. Okay, so I'm going to give this gentleman a trim. Because I'm not going to be clippering up the back and sides, I'm going to start at the top and work my way down. Doesn't mean to say you must do that every time, but it is a good technique. 
because when you think about it, even if you were going to clip her back and sides, if you've sorted that top out, cut it to the length and cut it to the shape and, and, and put the taper in the mesh that you're going to do, then when you use your clippers, it'll sail through it and you won't get a bulk line where you have trouble blending in. So there's all these little tips that I'm giving you really from experience. <coughs> so the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to analyze the top of the head, this hair. Now this comes with experience, it's not the kind of thing that you will instantly get, but it is very important, it really is. I want you all to, to concentrate now, and when I ask you this question, I want you to think how you would do it. All right, a gent your client says to you, can you thin it out on top, it's a bit thick. That's a simple statement, and it's so easy to thin it out. What are you actually doing? When you say thin it out, what's actually happening to that hair? Think it through for a few seconds before I comment. Just have a think. What's actually happening to that hair when I thin it out? If anyone's got an answer, I'd love to hear it. You're removing bulk. I am removing bulk. How am I doing it? What's happening to the hair? Are you moving length as well? Pardon? Moving length as well. Um, if you say I am, yeah. I mean, if that thins it out, yes. But what, what, say I picked up a mesh of hair, what am I doing to it to thin it out? Removing volume. Yes, I'm removing, I'm removing Tapering. some hairs, aren't I? Tapering so the, it. Pardon? Tapering it. Yeah. When we talk about taper, we talk about a bit like a lump of cheese, right? a wedge of cheese. Thick at one end, thin at the other. If you pick a mesh of hair up, if it's thick at the base and thin at the ends, you've got a good taper. If, however, the mesh that you've picked up, whether it's from to the side, has only been cut with scissors and has no other hairs in that that are shorter than that, and that's all the same length, then you have a thick head of hair. That's what the client means. By putting a taper in it, then you are creating a tapered mesh which looks natural. Now this is the bit I'm going to explain later on in more detail for you. Because it's so important in barbering, it's important in ladies hairdressing, but it's critical in barbering because you're doing a maintenance based service. This guy's going to come in every month and sort for of half an inch off. If you don't deal with the mesh, it'll just get thicker and thicker and thicker. Then he will say to you, can you thin it out? Then barbers of old used to get the thinning scissors and just hack into it, any old hell, and say, there you are, I've done it. And what they created was a mess because they had short hairs and long hairs next to each other, which isn't natural. So you've got to create a natural effect. Now, if I pick that mesh up and I backcomb it like that, I've pushed down about six hairs. So that proves most of that hair is the same length. And that's what you must get into your head. If you leave here with nothing else, that's the most important thing. Remember that you are dealing with hair, that you've got to analyze that hair to see how much of it is the same length. Then you can deal with it. There are some hairstyles when you want that length. So it's not all it isn't always the rule, but to create the conditions, I can look through his hair now and I can see masses of one length in it. Now when it's finished, have a good look at it now, just have a look at his hair, stand up and come and gather around, come on, have a look at it, <coughs> you'll want to learn by watching, sorry about the cameras, <laughs> have a look, can you see all the bulk, I mean it's a lovely effect, there's nothing wrong with it. It, it, in a way, in a long way, it, do, it looks great. But for traditional barbering, and to understand why you do what you do, I need to do this for you to show you. So there you have it, all that bulk, all that you were talking about, weight. It's okay. But now you'll see the difference. Mentally picture that. Now you'll see the difference in a few minutes of, of a completely more natural, professional looking standard. All right, back to seats.
Now I could do this tapering with a razor because the hair is long enough and it would look good, it would look really good but the most efficient tool is your tapering scissors that's why we don't call, I don't call them thinning scissors if you buy these from Germany these are American, but if you buy the same thing from Germany they are actually called tapering scissors because if you call them thinning scissors that's exactly what you'll do, you'll thin and you're not thinning you're producing a tapering mesh, which is nothing like thinning. You could chip in, you could texturize, you could do all sorts of different techniques, but that's not natural. That's not the way nature does it. That's where the word comes from. So I'm going to demonstrate now how to create a natural effect through that top using my tapering scissors. I'm going to turn around and shrink it down a little bit more. I'm only five foot six. Okay, here we go. I like to work on damp hair. Um, tapering scissors are best done on damp hair. I wouldn't have them on so so soaking wet hair, but certainly damp hair is fine. So here we go. Very simple, very quick. Take a section at the front. So you're going to do all the cut with your tapering scissors? Not all of it, no. Quite a lot. Do you ask the question, sorry? It's all right, it's all right. I heard a voice, but I couldn't, <laughs> I couldn't see it. Yes? So what do you see the difference between doing that and thinning? Thinning it out? Well, I can thin it by doing that. <laughs> right. Yeah. But this is organised, and if I, if I separate this mesh and hold it up for you, instead of it being all one length, it's now pushing hairs down because they're shorter than the finger. It's a gradual taper. Um, if you look at the handout I've given you, it shows you a tapered mesh. One of them is a picture of all one length hair, and one is a picture of a tapered mesh. Now, you put your hand over the tapered bit at the bottom, like that, and you start putting it downwards, and the further you, this is cutting the hair lengthwise. If you keep removing the length, what's happening to that mesh? It's getting thicker. Getting thicker. Correct. So therefore, you've got to do it again because now you've minimised it. You've got to make that tapered as well. You repeat customers, all right? Thank you, sir. You repeat customers, well, they're going to keep coming back to you. To oh yes, yeah, because you, because you know what you're talking about. You know what you're doing. Yeah, yeah. It's the thinning scissors. Tapering scissors have got a dreadful reputation. They're beautiful. They're the best thing ever in barbering. What's happened to them is they've not been understood and the barbers haven't used them correctly. I, I'll tell you a story, it takes too long. And all I can say is a guy came into my shop who'd been had to be ruined by these, and all I did was just cut it with my ordinary scissors, cut the shape, and it was the best haircut I've ever done, one of them anyway. And I couldn't understand it, and that's why that theory came out. Although something's going on here. This guy's hair has been ruined by thinning scissors, but by cutting it a bit short and putting it the shape in, it's beautiful. Because he got the taper in the mesh. Yeah. Can you know, I was taught that you should only taper every two haircuts and every third haircut, you should just use normal scissors to take any sort of, because obviously your hair grows independently anyway, that's what I was taught. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of tuition of all sorts of things, but you work it out yourself. If a guy comes in regularly, it's not about how regularly he comes in, and it's not about how much he has cut off, it's about analysing the mesh of hair that you're going to do with the top, and saying how much of that hair is one length. Mm -hmm. it, it may be that you don't need to. Um, there was a guy last, last night while I was demonstrating came in, an Asian guy, beautiful head of hair. I didn't need to do it because his hair had already been tapered through. So I didn't do it. But nine times out of ten I have to do it. Because what happens is if you don't do it first, you create the bulk. Because you're cutting it shorter, there's more bulk and more hairs of the same length. It's a philosophy that's so, well, not strange to you. It takes a lot of the thinking through. I mean, I've had 51 years at it, so I've just about got my head around it. I was, it, 
I was about to say oriental minutes. hair is oriental hair, you know, where it's dead straight and coarse. You not know, find that you're better off with tapering with that, really, aren't you? With that coarseness, if you get what I mean. To be truthful, it, it isn't anything to do with the thickness of each no. individual hair. No. People ask me, would you do this on a man with fine hair? Yes. Yeah. If it was all one length, if it was getting all one length, I'd break it down much more, more natural. So th this is what I'm getting yeah. at. It's very important to understand. All right, I'm going to keep going. When you're cutting it back, you're not just cutting one side. You're snipping a few times. Uh, yes, I'll, I'll demonstrate that again. I cut once about halfway, twice, three times, perhaps four times. And as I'm combing through, I can see the reaction I'm getting. Sometimes I just go through it with one. It's an individual thing, but it, it can show it much better. You actually have to watch your hair being cut. You have to watch what results you're getting. You're going to ask me a question in a minute. I'll beat you to it. Wouldn't you cut length off first before you did this? I bet you're all dying to ask that question. If the hair was very long, yes. I'd cut it down to within that reason. But one of the things I don't do, you've seen me going into the hair cut before I go on the outside, and that's simple. Because if I was to shorten that first with my ordinary scissors and then use these, the hair cut would shrink. Because the guts would be off the ends and it would be shrinking again. If you look at your two pictures, you can see that the bottom picture now, the ends are very thin. And that gives less volume. So, I go in with my taping scissors first, even use my razor first if I have to, and produce that. I'll just demonstrate using the razor on it for you. Just water in there. Yeah, just water in there. Uh, it's, a, it's a product called uh, Infratreat, and to be honest with you, it's a, a good cutting uh, tool. Rather than just plain water, it's spirity, and because of that, it's, um, it dries better, you know, it's, it's much better to work with. I love it, I love this stuff. Is it like a leave-in conditioner? Yeah, I think it is, really. I mean, pass it around. It's, it's, it's good. I, I like it. I get it from my other hours, and I like it. Uh, by the way, if your hairstyle is going forward, this is the technique you would use to produce that tapered mesh there. Right. You see? Now I'm going to do this with the razor for you. Yeah, you can't see it off, can you? Does it matter which way you cut it? Do you know what I mean? You said if the hair starts coming forward, why would it matter if you take it back and cut it? Because as long as you produce the tape and mesh, it doesn't matter. But for ease of working, if a guy has already got his hairstyle going forward, it's much easier to do the tape. In fact, when I teach, that's the very first lesson I usually encourage uh, using the tape and scissors. Because if students never use scissors before, they don't do a lot of damage if you do it wrong. You know, they don't suddenly cut a line in it. They, they produce more texture. Now this is uh, the way with the, the razor uh, that you can use. You can do it three fingers like that. Just gently stroke it. Working your way perhaps forwards. That will produce the same thing by keeping going right to the end by producing that tapered mesh. And so on. And I would probably use this technique at first so that I can get quite a lot of the hair off. And then, if I feel that it still needs a bit more, I can do a little bit of razor cutting through the top like this. And what this is doing is creating a similar effect, but giving me the opportunity to go a little bit deeper, so that the bottom of the hair is being removed as well. Some of the hairs near the roots are being removed, but not so many, because it will show. Now, when I've done the top, I'm going to do the back and side. The principle of the tapered mesh, what I've just explained to you, works on hair that is 40, 50, 60 inches long 
as much as it works when it's 0.5 of an inch long. It's the same principle. It, I made a statement which does sound very, very strange and hard to believe, but I believe that most haircuts, traditional haircuts certainly, it's not right to use your ordinary scissors first, unless you're really lovable, because you'll create a problem that you're going to deal with. Do you always start at the top? No, I don't always start. It depends on, on the hairstyle. Depends what I want to create. <coughs> How would you do it if you what, like, wore it back and forward? You know, like if he did it... That's part of the dressing out, really. The actual cut is the basis of the same. Right. So it's only when you've finished it and you're dressing it out would you divide it and put one one way, one the other. But as I'm working, I'm looking at it, see? I'm looking at the sections that I'm picking up. And I'm checking the amount of hair that's there, the amount of hair that's one length. Let me water for the spray. Yeah, oh, oh, I'll do that. Right, Oh, do you? <laughs> In its own way, it, it was a lovely cut because. In its own way, too. Like. Yeah, honestly, it, it. I didn't know. It was. Um, it's the kind of cut that I would do. I would create a lot of bulk on that top. For instance, you can get guys with curly or wavy hair. And if you use the razor or the tapering scissors, you'll calm it right down. Now, some men want the hair quite curly, so you would you want more of one length. So it's not the golden rule. You don't do this every time. But what you do is you use your head to find out what the client would suit, what looks best, and then you start to decide in your own experience what to do, what, what technique to use, and how much hair of one length you want to leave. It's more critical in barroom because, as I say, it's a maintenance-based craft. With they come in regularly for the haircut. It's not like a lady's where it's six or seven weeks in between, and it's a different complex altogether. This is one of the variations we talked about between men's and ladies, wasn't it? We were saying how different it was. Right, so that top now has been tapered through. It is now thinner. It's a thinner head of hair. It's bound to be. It's not what you cut off. It's what you leave on. It's a thinner head of hair. So now I'm returning to my tapering scissors, and now I'm going to do the sides down here and the back. So I break the hairstyle in the middle, just a simple break. Now remember when I said about the head shape, I don't want too much off this top bit, I want that to have a little bit of lift. But below that, it needs to dive into the hairline. All traditional barbering has is the, the hairline, this. This is traditional barbering. As soon as you do that, you're into that world. If you look behind you, you'll see four lengths that men normally wear their hair. This is long, where it fully covers the ear. Sorry, sure, sorry. This is a long hairstyle, where it fully covers the ear. This is a medium length hair, where it partly covers the ear. A bit like deal and no deal, this guy. This is barbering, where we've exposed the ear. And this is very short hair, that's short hair. And this is very short hair, where we do sit. So those are the four main lengths that men will wet their hair. And the critical point is when they take it off their ears, that's barbering. 